Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone out in Zoom. Um, welcome today to this UQAI seminar series event. This is one of the, sorry. I stepped closer. Oh, so you can be seen. Yeah. <laughs> and this is one of the uh, activities of the UQAI co-laboratory. Uh, and today we have a presentation by Gregor Verbich, who you can see to my right here, uh, on AI and energy challenges and opportunities in grid integration. I've just got a few things to say before we get started. So first of all, an acknowledgement of country. The University of Queensland and I personally would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and their custodianship of the lands. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue the cultural and spiritual connections to their country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. So the AI is as part of the co-laboratory have been running all year um, and Prior to this topic, uh, the energy topic today, we've also covered some, um, some interesting topics in the areas of agriculture and health. Uh, the purpose of these seminars really is to promote transdisciplinary AI research and collaboration because AI, oh, is there a, excellent. AI, AI, AI doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's either applied and has impact or it doesn't do anything at all. So the application domains of AI are very important and today we'll, and as I said, in the past, we have looked at uh, topics applying AI techniques in both agriculture and health as part of the AI seminar series this year. Um, very much the purpose of this uh, series of uh, presentations has been to connect UQ AI researchers and students with each other um, outside of ITEE across the university and engage with those high impact areas as I've just listed. Um, so this seminar today is going to be looking at the grid integration of massive numbers of, of uh, distributed energy resources, rather than preempt your introduction, though, I'll just skip through this one. Okay. Um, actually, before we go on to this, I have to cop, jump over to the webpage. Yep. No, that's your slides. So we have another upcoming event um, that, excellent. We have another upcoming event in the AI space at UQ. That is the UQ workshop on artificial intelligence. So this is a two day workshop showcasing UQ AI research and development, um, as a real on-campus experience for people to get together and talk about AI and AI applications. Uh, this is the third year. I think we've run this, um, the dates, are down here. So the 31st of October, so the end of this month and the 1st of November, you can register, attend, or you can submit a paper for a poster presentation or possibly a, a verbal presentation. So you're really strongly encouraged if you are researching in AI um, or have an application of AI to your specific high impact domain, please get involved, come along. It's going to be a really exciting time. We've got some um, some good keynotes organized and some good panel sessions organized as well. But without further ado, I'll get on to the presentation today. So today's guest is Professor Gregor Verbich, um, who is at the University of Sydney, the Centre for Future Energy Networks there in the School of Electrical and Information Engineering. Gregor's background is um, his bachelor and PhD were at the University of Ljubljana in Slovenia before taking on a postdoc in Canada at the University of Waterloo in Ontario. I'm working off memory here. Uh, and then taking up a role at the University of Sydney in about 2010. Right, excellent. Well, uh, Greg is one of my closest collaborators, so I'm very happy to have Gregor here today. Um, and without any further ado, over to you, Gregor. Thank you. Thank you, Archie. Um, I would like to also add that I met Archie, I think in 2012. Um, so he spent uh, a huge chunk of his career at uh, Sydney working with me. And he also influenced, influenced um, a lot of my work uh, because at the time I needed someone with complementary expertise. I'm a power systems person by training. Um, back then I didn't know much about other stuff that I um, know a little bit more about today. So uh, thank you Archie for all your <laughs> contribution. I guess we benefited from each other, which is 
<laughs> the way things should be. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me. And also thanks, uh, Xingxin and Caroline, for organizing the um, um, the, the the trip and everything else. Um, yeah, I know. So I can probably. Okay. So um, <clears throat> the title of my talk is a bit more general than the actual content. So when I Arch invited me, I, I proposed this topic, which I didn't change. So really what I will, I will be talking about is one specific aspect of this massive integration of distributed energy resources and the challenges that brings about, and that's operating envelopes, which is a way to prevent um, prosumers from causing problems in distribution networks when they export power to the grid, for example, when there is simply too much uh, rooftop solar uh, generation. And that work has been done um, in collaboration with my uh, PhD student UE at the University of Sydney. Um, and I also had a visiting student from the Josef Stefan Institute in Slovenia today, Krivets. Um, he contributed also some of uh, the work that um, I'll present today. Uh, so I structured my talk, it's basically targeting to audiences, computer scientists um, or AI people who don't maybe don't know much about power systems and also power systems engineers. So I apologize to power systems engineers because of the introduction will probably be a bit too simplistic for your liking, but I'll make up for that later on where I talk a bit more on the um, AI stuff. <clears throat> So I'll talk about the background and motivation. So what motivates my work? Uh, a little bit of a story how um, power systems are changing and the increasing uptake of, of uptake of distributed energy resources and where this is um, heading. And then I'll talk about op uh, dynamic operating, um, uh, dynamic export limits or operating envelopes, which is uh, a tool to manage a uh, large uptake of uh, distributed energy resources. And specifically, I'll present a, a method that we develop, um, which is based on chance constraint optimal power flow. And an important component of that is being able to predict PV, uh, PV generation and electricity demand uh, with parametric uncertainty bounds, uh, bounds which feed as an input into the chance constraint optimal power flow formulation. And I'll, I'll mostly talk about generative adversarial neural networks, which is one way to, to get those uh, parametric uncertainty bounds. And I also have a, quite a few slides, which I probably won't have the time to go to about Gaussian processes, which is very preliminary work. Um, and it's, it just is an alternative method to generate those parametric um, uncertainty bounds. And then finally, I'll present some results and discussion, but I have to admit that this is quite preliminary still because this work is probably, we started working on that maybe a year ago. Um, so it's still a lot of work to be done. Okay, so <clears throat> for those of you who are no, not intimately familiar with what, what is currently happening in the power, electric power industry. Um, that's a snapshot from South Australia from uh, last weekend. So this here is um, last Sunday. Um, and that these are the energy flows in, um, in the uh, electric power system. The yellow stuff, so this bright yellow is rooftop solar. This dark yellow is utility scale solar. And this line here indicates zero, which means that on Sunday in South Australia, more than all power demand came from solar and the vast majority of it was rooftop solar. So what it means is that the power is now increasingly coming from the distribution system and flowing even um, upwards. Um, I've also got this map of Australia, but I think you all know when South Australia is. Um, what is maybe worth mentioning in this context is that South Australia is connected to the rest of the national electricity market, which by the way, it's not quite national because it's not connected uh, to WA. Uh, but the connection to the rest of the NAM, the national electricity market is quite weak. So there's this, um, so this is from um, AEMO's integrated system plan. So the transmission lines here don't exist yet. Um, so South Australia is connected to the NAM through that um, uh, link to Victoria. There's one uh, transmission line that is actually not that strong. So in electrically, South Australia is almost an island. So in that sense, it's really at the forefront, at the bleeding edge of global development in terms of the uptake of rooftop solar and also wind. So a week before, so this green 
here stuff is, is wind. So South Australia is sourcing most of its power from wind and solar, which is fundamentally different to how power systems were operating um, in the past. So now if we look at the projection of um, the uptake of rooftop solar and also home batteries, so we are currently somewhere here, 2020, a bit more than 10 gigawatts um, in the NEM, uh, but the projection is that that capacity will be more than 50 gigawatts in 2050. And today, the whole installed capacity in the NEM is roughly in the same ballpark. So we'll add almost, we'll double the capacity of the existing generation fleet just by the addition of rooftop solar. And on top of that, we'll also get new wind and coal fire, will, coal fire generation will retire. But what I'm saying here is that this is changing the nature of power system, uh, basically from... Uh, generation following load, which was the case in the past, now from load following um, generation. And so this uptake of rooftop solar is uh, coupled with an increasing uptake of uh, home batteries. So the last number I heard is that maybe uh, almost one in five new PV installations come with home batteries. Um, so uh, the projection is that by 2050, we'll get roughly 40, so uh, let's say 40, uh, these are gigawatt um, hours. So um, the batteries are typically, typically with two, two hours of storage. So that means roughly uh, 20 gigawatts worth of additional capacity. So those batteries can inject into the grid 20 gigawatts for two hours. If you put that on top of 50 gigawatts coming from fruit of solar, that's more than the whole capacity we currently have in the NEM. So all that goes to show that the power systems of the future will be increasingly decentralized. Um, this is from AEMO um, Energy Networks Australia, Open Energy Networks paper back from 2018. And it, actually they took it from Blue Bloomberg. Um, they predict that uh, we'll get almost 50% of uh, the whole uh, total power from behind the meter distributed energy resources, mostly rooftop solar, um, coupled coupled with uh, with batteries. Okay, so that all looks good. Um, <clears throat> but we have to keep in mind that those resources are connected to an electric power system with its own constraints. So if we contrast the situation in the past where most of the power was flowing from like a few uh, large power stations down to the loads connected at the distribution network. So this is like still is, um, a simplified diagram on the right where we have this transmission network here in the middle and then the power flows if you look at the direction of the arrows flows outwards towards the fringes of the grid um, now with the uptake of all those um, DR so if you notice here so each house now has a rooftop solar and a small battery now the power now flows in both directions right and this is what is started has started to happen already so in Queensland and South Australia in particular the uptake of rooftop solar is such that um, this occasionally already creates problems in the network. So what it means is that as you increase um, the penetration of distributed energy resources, rooftop solar predominantly, uh, you start to get voltage problems. So when um, there is not enough underlying demand in the middle of the day and the sun is shining, you generate a lot of power, you feed all that power into the network and that raises voltages and that's a problem for distribution networks that are simply not designed to operate that way. So you can see that those uh, bubbles are getting darker and darker red and that's at one point you say that's enough. And that's exactly what the industry has realized. So they actually, that was from a couple of years ago, um, network service providers started discussing imposing or charging customers for feeding power into the grid, which basically defies the purpose of um, rooftop solar generation, which is to reduce the cost for end customers. And that's obviously in no one's uh, benefit. And the Australian Energy Market Commission, the rule maker, realized that that's not the way to go. So they are now actively thinking, and the whole industry is now trying to think how to turn that huge resource that can create a lot of problems into an opportunity. Um, because I mentioned before, rooftop solar increasingly comes with batteries, and batteries offer a lot of flexibility um, and electric vehicles in the future will can do the same so suddenly we'll end up with huge uh, flexible resource sitting behind the meter which if we are smart about it we can turn it into a useful resource uh, but to be able to do that <clears throat> we have to change the structure of the um, electricity 
market. Um, in particular, we'll need uh, new entities. I call them an aggregator. So it's not quite clear who exactly will play that role, whether this will be a completely new um, entity, whether retailers will serve that role, maybe DNSPs can do that. Um, but what I'm trying to show here is that in the old power system or the deregulated power system of today, um, the electricity flow is mostly from generators down to the customers and then the financial flow, it's in the other direction. Um, but now with the, with the increasing penetration of prosumers, I use prosumers to refer to customers that can both uh, produce and consume power. Uh, you can see that the electricity flow is now in both directions, so they can potentially feed power upwards. Um, and they also get paid for the services they provide. And for that, we need a new entity, which I call an aggregator, but it's not quite clear who exactly will serve that role. Um, but it's also increasingly important that distribution system operators, I call them DSOs, even though in Australia they are called distribution network service providers, so they don't quite operate the networks yet. And they're heading in that direction, but they're not quite DSOs yet. Um, they will have to coordinate uh, with the retailers and because the retailers are the ones who have a contractual relationship with the customers. They need close, they need, they will need to work closely uh, one with another to prevent uh, those prosumers causing problems in the, uh, in the network when they send power um, upward. So this is now currently um, um, evolving. Okay, so I guess now, the motivation is clear. So we have this massive amount of distributed energy resources. We want to turn them into a useful resource. We need an aggregator to do that, but how exactly we do this? Well, um, we can formulate that as, a, as an optimization problem where we minimize uh, some notion of cost or profit or maximize some notion of profit uh, where the decision variables uh, belong both to the aggregator, uh, presumer agents, my presumers, um, and the networks, right? So that sounds fine in principle. Um, so here I have like a distribution system operator, uh, the presumers and the aggregator sitting in between. Um, but how to formulate that optimization problem and how to solve it in practice, it's probably a bit far-fetched at the moment, but at least conceptually, you can think of the DR aggregation problem um, in that way. And in fact, um, Archie and I were involved in a trial, a Bruni Island uh, battery trial, where, um, and this here is a picture of Bruni Island, which is a small island of the main coast of Tasmania. Uh, TAS networks, um, uh, so the problem they have on the island is that at least when we did the project, um, there was only one underwater cable connecting Tasmania with Bruni Island, and the capacity of that cable was not sufficient to supply the load on the island on long holidays, uh, sorry, long weekends and holidays. Um, uh, so they figured out that instead of using or putting another diesel generator, so there are two diesel generators on the island, um, instead of putting another diesel generator on the island or increase the capacity of the cable, a better way is to put batteries in people's homes, put rooftop, uh, uh, rooftop solar on the roofs and use that capacity to augment the capacity of the cable to reduce the consumption of diesel. Um, and this, this is what we trialed in that project. And we indeed ended up formulating the problem as a distributed um, energy resource coordination problem as an, and when we cast it as an optimal power flow problem. Um, I won't go into the specifics, but the, the objective was basically to minimize the usage of diesel while meeting the constraints of the network, which is essentially this canonical DR aggregation problem that I mentioned um, before. So the problem that the project was actually quite successful. Um, and ANU who led, who led uh, the project, they actually then decided to commercialize that solution. Uh, it's called network aware coordination. Um, but my understanding is that I is that that's a bit more um, the industry found the solution a bit more too sophisticated. Um, so if you look at the uh, the Energy Networks Australia Open Energy Networks project paper I mentioned before, um, they have this figure here where on the x-axis is the sophistication of DR coordination approaches and on the y-axis is the net value that it can unlock. So you can see that they have, they, they, they did put optimization on the top, um, acknowledging the fact that yes, that is a potentially the way to go. Um, but to actually implement that in practice, it's still a bit too far-fetched because the network service providers simply don't have the infrastructure 
to do that at scale. Um, so what I'm going to focus on today is this solution in the middle, which is using dynamic export limits, which essentially is like trying to achieve the same objective as that optimization-based DR coordination, but do it in a way that it's computationally and implementation-wise easier. So that's currently what the industry is uh, working on and that the mo most of the, my talk will be um, about that. So I'll talk about dynamic um, export limits or we also call them um, operating envelopes. So what they are. So um, in states, Queensland and South Australia in particular, where the penetration of rooftop solar is such that, they, that network service providers have uh, need to actively curtail PV exports in the middle of the day from creating, creating problems. So this is um, uh, this here is this static export limit, which is typically set about five kilowatts. So each customer gets five kilowatts export limit. That's how much you can export. That's it. And if you if you end up if you have a, a ten kilowatt system, that's obviously suboptimal because it's not easy to find five kilowatts worth of additional consumption. For the whole day, right? You might run your pool pump or do your washing in the middle of the day, but that's pretty much the extent of it. Now, a better way of doing that is to come up with dynamic export limits. So you dynamically adjust the export limit um, subject to the, the, pre the prevailing condition in the network. And this is this green, green um, line on the top that occasionally can get quite constrained but overall is significantly higher than this blanket five kilowatt constraint that is obviously suboptimal. Now, the question is, um, how do you compute those, op those operating envelopes given that network companies don't have full, full observability of the network? And in fact, they have very poor visibility of the network. Now in Victoria, um, they, ha they have completed their smart meter um, rollout. So every customer has a smart meter. So in principle, the retailer knows what their customers are doing, but the retailers are not responsible for managing the networks, right? And they don't necessarily talk to the network companies. So they live in silos. That's, those silos are still quite firmly in place. So that, that's one problem. Um, in other states, in New South Wales, I think the penetration of smart meters, I don't know, 20%. So. Um, we don't know, or network companies don't know, or even the retailers don't know what 80% of the customers are doing. So how can you then actively manage that? And on top of that, network companies also don't have, um, uh, don't really know, don't have models of their low voltage networks, because that's simply the way how networks were operated in the past. The demand side was passive, and the role of the supply, the, gen the generators will simply supply the power consumed by the loads. So downstream from the distribution transformer, network companies didn't care what happened. So they have to adjust the, the taps on the distribution transformer to make sure that the voltages were within fixed limits and that's it. And customers were passive, so they could predict very well in advance what customers will do. But now this is now changing and we haven't really started. Um, uh, we, uh, so the uptake of electric vehicles haven't even started yet on scale. So when that happens, that will be like, like a few magnitudes, the problem will get a few magnitudes bigger. So, okay, so um, the question is now, how do you compute those dynamic export limits or operating envelopes, given that you have poor observability of, of the networks? Um, <clears throat> so I will present um, one particular way of how you can possibly do that. And if you talk, of, if you talk uh, to network companies um, with the little visibility they have at the moment, the way they approach this problem is very approximate at best. So what I'm going to present today is probably two steps ahead of what the industry is ready for, but at least it hopefully shows the way how it could be done eventually in the future. Okay, so this is quite an important slide. So now if you think about operating envelopes and the role networks have to do, so they have to anticipate what customers will do let's say day ahead, they have to compute those operating envelopes, send them to customers, and then customers are free to do whatever they want to do. Network companies um, or aggregators, they don't have uh, direct control over customers. They, they cannot directly control their, their devices. So they have to anticipate what they are going to do. And that's what we assumed in this formulation. So essentially, this is form the, the, the optimization problem is formulated as uh, maximizing 
uh, network hosting capacity. So we maximize the minimum export limit across all customers, right? So we set the minimum export limit for all customers and we try to push it as high as possible. That's basically maximizing um, uh, network hosting capacity. And we assume, now in this work, we assume that every customer has a battery, a rooftop solar system and a battery. So what we assume is that um, in real time operation, customers will follow the same control strategy as the DSOs in the computation. Um, so the DSOs in the computation of the operating envelopes um, assume that the customers will follow the same operation strategy. And this is to maximize PV self-consumption, right? So this is implicit in this formulation where these DR operational constraints what the DSO assumes that every customer will follow the same optimization strategy, which is to maximize PV self-consumption. So you can then expect that you compute the operating envelopes, you send them to the customers, they maximize PV self-consumption uh, themselves using the same optimization problem, which is embedded here. And in reality, those operating envelopes should be effective. Now, in practice, that's not necessarily true. So customers might do something else. So how to go about doing that, I don't know. This is um, um, ongoing work, but that's what we used. Uh, that's uh, the assumption we used um, um, in this work. So essentially, um, the, uh, the optimization problem to compute operating envelopes. Envelopes is formulated as an optimal power flow problem, which is minimized cost subject to network constraint, assuming that you can control customer home batteries. So basically like PV self-consumption, but with coordination. Um, and as I said, in practice, that's not quite, you cannot implement that because DSOs don't have real-time smart meter data yet. They don't have full visibility. And that's a challenge that we have to address. Um, and we are thinking how to do that, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the schematic di diagram of, of uh, this approach is on the left-hand side, we have the distribution system operator, um, where again, we assume that they, have, uh, they do have uh, the network model, which in practice is not true. Um, <clears throat> and we also assume that they can forecast what customers will do in the next day in terms of uh, PV generation and electricity demand. So they compute those um, operating envelopes. And because those forecasts are uncertain, we formulate the problem as a stochastic optimal power flow problem. So it's chance constraint optimal power flow problem. It's not a de deterministic one. Um, so those export limits are computed day ahead, sent to the customers, and then in real time operation, customers then use their own home energy management systems, which follow the same optimization strategy, which is to maximize PV self-consumption, um, to maximize the use of their PV. Now, um, I probably won't go in the de mathematical details. So I just uh, will mention that, um, so this uh, DR operational constraints, as I said, the DSO assumes that the optimization run behind the meter, um, um, is um, basically PV self-consumption maximization, which can be formulated in this case as a mixed integer linear uh, problem. So we have a couple of integer variables. One is uh, exporting power to the grid and the direction of the battery flow. We assume that we have a hybrid inverter, so uh, PV and a battery with a hybrid inverter and some um, underlying demand. And occasionally customers can end up sending power to the grid when PV generation exceeds local demand. And this is what we want to limit using this power export limit. Um, so this is just a mixed integer linear problem, nothing uh, too sophisticated about that, uh, where the objective is to maximize PV self-consumption, which in Australia is equivalent to maximize, oh, sorry, minimize the difference between uh, what you pay for importing power from the grid. And we assume that customers um, are exposed to time of use tariffs uh, minus what you uh, get paid for sending power to the grid for which you get paid the feed-in tariff. And because feed-in tariff is always less than the time of use tariff, that's equivalent to maximizing PV self-consumption. Um, so then we have battery constraints, uh, power balance constraints and so on. So I won't go into that. Um, okay, so now, 
I mentioned that this uh, the computation of operating envelopes can be formulated as this um, optimal power flow model, but now we would like to make it stochastic. So we would like to take into account the fact that forecasts are not um, perfect. So we would like to be able to um, incorporate uh, chance constraints and also network security constraints, which is essentially the power flow equations are nonlinear, right? So uh, because of that, um, even though the DR problem is uh, MILP, so mixed integer linear, uh, we have non-convex nonlinear constraints for the, uh, the network and stochastic chance constraint that in direct form cannot even be incorporated um, in this optimization problem. So we have to deal with that. And if you're interested, that was uh, presented at the Power System Computation Conference this year and published in Electric Power Systems Research. So all the details um, are in the paper. Um, and if uh, I'm happy to for Archie to distribute the slides, but if you want a copy, you can also send me an email. I'll send you a copy of the slides. Um, okay, so I would just briefly skim to that. So the network security constraints, we formulate that as a, a branch flow, uh, second order, second order cone branch flow um, model. Um, so I mentioned DR operation constraints. This is maximum power export limit. Um, PV generation and electricity demand, we assume that we forecasted, which is this the mean value. So these are forecasted values and there is some uncertain error. Um, so we would like to be able to, to compensate for that uh, for, uh, forecast um, error. So for that, we, we use an affine battery control policy that simply uses the batteries to to compensate for that um, mismatch. And on top of that, we have those stochastic chance constraints. And for those of you who are not familiar with chance constraints, what we are saying is that we don't want the constraints strictly enforced. Instead, we want those constraints to be satisfied with a certain probability. So for example, we say, okay, fine, the voltages can should be um, in this case above the minimum limit or below the maximum limit. 90%, 95% of the time, right? So they, they are. So that's how um, chance constraints are formulated. And again, you cannot really plug that directly into a, mat a mathematical uh, programming uh, framework. So we have to do something about it. Um, so the way we approach that, <clears throat> first we linearize, uh, we linearize uh, the uh, OPF problem around the operating point. So that's the de deterministic point forecast, if you want, so like the deterministic operating condition under which, uh, around which uh, we want we want to dispatch resources to, uh, to, to stay within um, uh, limits. So we linearize that around this operating point and we can show that the solution um, is the same as uh, for the nonlinear or the full version because the KKT conditions are the same. So this is the first trick we use. Um, now the chance constraints um, for voltages and battery powers can be can be straightforwardly, um, it's straightforward to convert them into, um, into um, linear uh, constraints. Um, again, the details are in the paper, um, so I won't go into that uh, here. For apparent power, apparent power um, uh, P and Q, that's a bit um, that's a bit uh, trickier. So we have to introduce some um, auxiliary variables, and then we end up with a second order cone um, constraint that can be then plugged in directly into this OPF formulation. So. Um, the optimization, so the chance constraint AC OPF formulation that we propose then consists of this linearized power flow constraints. Um, then we have reformulated voltage and uh, voltage and battery chance constraints, which are linear, um, and apparent power chance constraints, which are um, SOC and convex. So that's um, that's um, 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 MI, uh, so mixed integer second order cone program that can be solved efficiently using existing solvers. For example, Gurobi can do that quite quite well. Um, okay, so that's the first bit. So this optimal power flow formulation to compute the operating envelopes. Um, now I haven't, does not, uh, now I will talk about how do we actually come up with those uh, forecasts, right? So we need, um, so we need forecasts with uh, probability bounds. Um, and in particular, uh, the proposed OPF formulation requires uh, that uncertainty to be Gaussian. Right, again, this is not something that is necessarily true, definitely not, maybe for electricity demand, but definitely not for PV, not Gaussian. So this is also something that um, we are thinking about how to address that, but it's not, we haven't done it yet. 
um, so we use two different two different uh, forecasting techniques to come up with forecasts for PV generation and electricity demand with parametric uh, parametric bounds. One is conditional adversarial uh, neural networks or SIGANs, um, and the other one is Gaussian uh, processes. So uh, SIGANs basically uh, generate uh, a large number of scenarios, um, and they infer uh, those error bounds uh, from those scenarios, whereas Gaussian processes use principal Bayesian inference uh, by explicitly modeling the correlation between observed um, um, data. Okay, so I'll talk about GANs uh, first. So the way that's, that's done, um, so it's called a generative adversarial network. Adversarial because we, has, we basically have two neural networks. One is the generator and the other one is this, the discriminator. So um, at a high level, the way that works is that the generator generates synthetic demand profiles and tries to make them as close to real ones. So they should be statistically similar to the extent that the discriminator cannot distinguish between the real ones and the synthetic ones. Um, so um, this here is just um, LST, a long, long short-term uh, uh, neural, short-term memory neural network. And this one is, uh, um, convolutional uh, neural network uh, for the discriminator. So basically this is um, a classifier um, where this is um, a generates, generates uh, time series, uh, um, synthetic uh, demand profiles. Um, so uh, the, this adversarial mechanism is, is essentially a game played uh, between the discriminator um, and uh, the generator, where the role of the generator is to to try to uh, to, uh, to to fool the discriminator by creating uh, those or synthesizing um, uh, demand profiles, and and tries to do that. So try to maximize the the probability of discriminator believing that they come from a real from a real uh, data set, whereas the discriminator tries to tries to um, um, uh, uh, tries to maximize the probability of distinguishing fake uh, demand profiles from from the real ones. So the way uh, that that works. So we um, we also use a couple of tricks um, with uh, a couple of additions to that. Um, a naive, uh, let's call it naive or basic uh, GAN implementation. Uh, we use Wasserstein GAN um, with an added uh, gradi gradient penalty, uh, penalty, and we also drop the lock um, uh, from those lo loss functions uh, to accelerate uh, the training. So again, the details are in the paper, so I won't really uh, dwell on that um, much longer. Um, we used, in this case, we used the smart, uh, smart grid, smart city, data set from Osgrid, um, almost 10 years um, old. Um, so uh, as, as what I forgot to mention, uh, we used also condition inputs. Uh, so that uh, this is this, this bit here um, to improve the ability of the generator to synthesize uh, demand profiles, synthetic demand profiles that look similar to the real ones. Um, and we use the historical data of the previous days, um, one, two, three, five, seven, 14, and 21 uh, days um, uh, before. Um, and uh, W is, I think it's uh, the day type and, and season, uh, season type. Uh, so we split, we split the data set into three parts. So the first one uh, was uh, used for training the point forecasting model. Uh, the second one was used for testing the point forecasts. Um, and when you train, the, when you test those point forecasts, you look at the uh, the errors, um, and those errors were used to train uh, the SIGEN model, uh, the the generator, um, and then the last test set was used to um, evaluate the performance um, of the forecasting um, network. So this is schematically uh, shown here. So as I mentioned before, we use long short-term memory uh, for point forecasting and convolutional neural network. Uh, um, in the um, for the for the um, the discriminator for the classifier. Okay, um, 
So I guess, I'll, as I said, I, I would skip, I'll skip the Gaussian processes bit. Now, this work is very preliminary. Um, I do have some preliminary results. Um, so what I try, what, what we try to do, so we assume that, and this is another, um, another practical implementation issue. Um, network service providers, as I said, they don't have access to smart meter data. If they want to get access, they have to buy it from the retailer and they can only do that for the previous day. So what we assumed is that um, they get the data at midnight for the previous day and they have to forecast for the next day. Right, so it's here, for example, uh, so at, at midnight, they get the data from last day and then do the forecasting for the next day. Um, so that's for uh, PV generation um, and um, uh, the load. And conceptually, this is the same as SIGAN. Um, we haven't tested, we haven't uh, rigorously compared uh, the two uh, the two methods yet. And even the performance of Gaussian processes is not quite as it should be. So this is still work in, in progress. So the results I'm going to present um, I use uh, the SIGEN network to generate those um, errors uh, with probabilistic parametric pro probabilistic bounds. So here we have the, um, this is the load forecast um, with the error bounds. I think this is 90% uh, quantile. Um, so electricity generation um, and uh, PV, sorry, electricity demand and PV generation. And this is done at the level of each household. So if you notice here, this is for um, uh, six kilowatts. So that's um, for uh, for each household. Um, and um, from that we inferred, so we fitted Gaussian or normal distribution around uh, those load predictions and solar generation predictions. Uh, and that those normal distributions were then used in the uh, stochastic or chance constraint ACOPF uh, model to compute the operating envelopes. Uh, so we use a simple uh, 25 bus distribution network. We assume that we have a balanced three-phase operation, which can then be represented by a single-phase model. And I know this is something that um, some people in the audience know uh, much more about than I do. Um, in practice, uh, networks are three-phase and possibly for wire, which are quite complicating connections. So um, as a proof of concept, that's fine, uh, but serious work needs to be to be done to convert that or to adjust that to, um, to realistic networks that are not single phase. Um, so this is just uh, how the results look like. So um, uh, this here is the power export to the grid. So you can see that in the middle of the day, Customers, I think we are showing this for all 25 customers. Uh, they export power to the grid. So when there's too much power, uh, this dynamic operating envelope needs to restrict power export. So this happens so here on this first day, and to a lesser extent on every other day, maybe also on the last day. Um, but most of the time, um, that operating limit uh, stays at the same um, level. Okay, so some conclusions. Uh, so as I mentioned, the work I presented here, it's not quite Im immediately applicable in practice. Um, so the first question that is still open is how do we go about computing those operating envelopes given that uh, network companies or aggregators, if you want, um, don't have full visibility of what customers um, are doing. Uh, so we formulated that as a uh, chance constraint OPF to cater uh, for the stochasticity of the demand um, uh, predictions, um, but we assume that the outputs are normally distributed, which is not quite um, true in practice. So uh, for future work, we need to generalize the model to non-Gaussian distributions. Um, how to incorporate that into um, the OPF problem, it's not straightforward. It's actually quite a bit more complicated than the work we presented here. So we are currently thinking about that. Um, so the next thing we assumed here that uh, the forecasting horizon is one day. So we forecast PV and electricity demand for one day ahead. But in practice, um, and this is where we want to influence so in the future work, uh, we'll change this, um, um, uh, the horizon length and also do a more comprehensive analysis of the performance of those operating envelopes, hoping to demonstrate the industry that uh, this communication between DSOs and retailers needs to be more frequent. And we would like to show um, how much data um, and how 
well in advance that data needs to be available for the DSO to compute to compute those operating um, um, envelopes. And also the last missing bit is what to do with the fact that uh, DSOs don't have uh, full visibility. Maybe the way to do is to synthesize missing or unobserved uh, PV generation electricity demand uh, forecast and use that in the framework similar to what I presented um, here. So I guess it's 40 minutes. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for that, Gregor. Uh, are there any questions in the, yes, Rich has a question. Not surprising. <laughs> I'll run the microphone up to you so people online. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for that talk. That was very interesting. Um, overlapped an awful lot with Project Shield of Arena, of course. Um, one thing that uh, I noticed was um, the slide where you mentioned uh, the Osgrid data. Hmm. So, um, you know, I, I've looked at that a bit myself at Redback and at UQ, and I decided that it was um, extremely artificial it was it was very cleaned like it had been thresholded but then all sorts of um yeah upper and lower 10 percent were thrown out and uh all sorts of um data that could have been real data was thrown out so um what to be honest, did you... i didn't know about that i yeah. i know we used we used the clean data set uh produced by Liz Ratnam uh when I think she yeah was yeah that's, that's the same one yeah 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 so it's like 250 out of 10,000 yeah um but yeah. we also the Gaussian processes work was used uh, so we used uh solar analytics data um oh, okay. which is raw yeah that's so great. no no yeah, yeah. we actually had to clean it there were a bit missing so we did yeah. we, we did fix that but yeah. we didn't we didn't polish it in any other way yeah um, okay I was just but as I said, I mean, this is, yeah, this is a valid comment. And as I said, this is just very preliminary. So we just yeah. did it once and haven't really thoroughly. Yeah. Um, okay. So that, yeah, that answers my question. If yeah, it's yeah. been used on like real data rather than, um, you know, yeah. um, data that was too much cleaned. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Greg, for your great uh, presentation. Uh, I'm Fei Fei. I have one question about your uh, solar and uh, uh, load uh, prediction part. So what is the input for this uh, like the prediction model? And uh, what's the resolution for the data? Thanks. Uh, 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Yeah. Okay. So which kind of data you use? Did you consider about the weather conditions? Uh, so in the second model, we didn't use weather, weather conditions. And I have to be perfectly honest, if you buy the, the forecast from uh, SolarCast, SolarCast, Sol, Sol, SolCast, SolCast, I think, they do a much better job than what we would do. I know that the company we work with, they use that. So for PV generation prediction, maybe it's you can, and they also give you bounds, not just the point forecast, they also give you bounds, and they do a fairly good job. So the company we work with actually use that and they are happy with that. So maybe for solar, so for solar uh, generation prediction, um, maybe we shouldn't bother. Um, whereas for the Gaussian processes, we did use, um, we did use um, also the weather data, which I do mention uh, somewhere here. So we use the, the, the weather data available from, um, I don't know where the, I do have mentioned that some of them. Uh, where do I mention that? Um, uh, I should be mentioned somewhere. Ah, here, yeah. So this is the the data available from the Bureau of Meteorology. Uh, we do have that for um, all the weather stations in New South Wales, although the cloud data is a bit patchy, not quite reliable. Um, but as I said, I, I wouldn't bother like in, in a practical implementation, I would simply buy data from Solcast. They do a good job. So, um, but yes, that's where well, we did in the SIGAN model, we didn't use weather data at all, which obviously is a drawback.
Hi, uh, Frederick Geth here from GridCube. Um, I've got a question uh, related to uh, using predictions to inform your um, dynamic operating envelopes. Um, as you are probably aware, um, GridCube uses state estimation to <laughs> um, develop uh, network visibility in real time. Um, I guess my question is, um, um, yeah, about the tension field between using predictions and using real time visibility. Where do you think it's going? Um, um, to be honest, I don't have a good answer to the question. So all I know is that retailers do have access to smart meter data, DNSPs don't. And I checked with um, um, someone who worked with us on that uh, Bruni Island trial who now works with ANU. I checked with her what, what, what is reasonable to assume. And she mentioned that, yes, you can buy these data for the next day with a 24 hour lag. Um, my understanding was that this is something that it's not done routinely, so it's still in the state of flux. So that's why I guess one, what, what, what we would like to find out in our work is, first of all, how much data do you need? Now, neglecting the fact that network uh, companies don't have network models, so I'll leave this aside. But the question we are trying to answer is how much data do you need? How frequent should it be and what resolution? So does it need to be from all customers with five minute resolution or you can simplify that and you don't have to, you don't have to transmit that much data so frequently, which then obviously will simplify implementation. But this is all subject to future research. Or uh, your answer. Yeah. Uh -huh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Guyan uh, wants to know, how do you justify the proposed DOE framework to fit? Um, yeah, okay. To fit into five minute dispatch interval of DMO. Okay, so uh, first of all, we are not necessarily bound by the five minute dispatch because retail cust uh, well, uh, residential customers are exposed to retail prices. They are not directly exposed to the wholesale market. So they are under, like the time of use tariffs are uh, just, Fixed. I mean, fixed in the sense that it's the same profile every day. So that's that that that's not necessarily um, an issue. Um, whether to go whether thirty minute resolution is fine or do we need to go down to five minutes? Um, I honestly don't know. <laughs> uh, maybe thirty minutes is fine, uh, especially given that predicting predicting demand at the household level is very challenging. Um, uh, but this is something that we need to we need to test in um, in the future. Um, but yes, the, the 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 fact that AEMO dispatches the market uh, every five minutes that's not necessarily um, related to uh, to the work I presented today. <clears throat> yeah. Chung, thanks for the talk, Gregor. So I have two questions, one specific and one broad. The specific one is in your CGAN, you also condition on previous information. Yes. Find that the, the LSTM that you're using is insufficiently powerful in doing the prediction and that you need to have these additional data sources. And is it something that you would recommend for anybody doing time series prediction? So if I understand your question correctly, the conditional inputs definitely do improve the performance. Um, in this sense. Um, yes and no, because um, these conditional networks, essentially what they do, they improve the generation of um, the generation of those synthetic demand profiling. Otherwise the input is just random noise. Um, right, so, so basically, you feed random noise, which is Gaussian or uniformly distributed, you feed that into the generator and you leave it to, to the generator to generate synthetic demand profiles. But if you condition those synthetic profiles on some previous inputs, then you can, the structure of the network is LSTM. But if you condition that on previous, um, previous information, then you can improve the performance. And my broader question probably will 
show off my ignorance in this topic, but you mentioned earlier that electric vehicles are going to change the way that all of these things work. So given that they are kind of a very distributed uh, solution to the batteries in terms of everybody now having larger capacity for storing uh, energy at the node versus a method that would be much more centralized or, or much higher level at like pumped hydro, for example, at, at a centralized um, yeah, at a centralized solution. Which of these uh, solutions do you think would have the greater impact and how do they fit into these kind of strategies that you've developed? That's an excellent question. Um, the reason why we should really try hard to use that flexibility that exists behind the meter, even though the devices are owned by selfish agents, self-interested agents, they don't care about power systems, is because they pay for that, for those devices, right? It doesn't require investment from network companies. So that, that resource already exists. It's just a question whether we use it or not. Um, now, the challenging bit is that all those devices are owned by end customers who are not necessarily interested in helping the network. They are interested in either like being able to drive to work every day or minimize their energy expenditure. Um, what works in our favor is that um, electric vehicle, so batteries of typical electric vehicles today are sufficiently large that you only need to charge them once a week. Or maybe if you trickle charge whenever you can, that's probably sufficient. So which means that you have um, a fairly huge resource available for you pretty much all the time. You only have to make sure that customers are not affected. So how to make this work, I don't know, but I like to, so this is an interesting, so I've been thinking about that um, in the future, like uh, another bit of, another aspect of that problem is that the generation in the future will mostly be zero marginal cost, right? So the, the way we determine electricity price in the network today, you basically charge everyone based on the last dispatch generator, which is typically coal-fired or gas-fired. So this price formation is well-defined, but in the future, when all coal-fired generation will be gone and we'll only use gas-fired generation occasionally, how do you form the price? I mean, maybe this notion that, that we use today, it's not viable anymore. On the other hand, you have this huge flexible resource sitting behind the meter. So if you use both of them, so the way I think this could work is to use the model we use in the telecommunications industry. As a customer, you only specify your level of comfort, which might be how much energy do you want in your battery, car battery every morning? And you set, set, set a certain limit. And what is the maximum um, power export limit you can either import or export from the grid? So the bigger the number, the more costly the plan. The lower the number, then meaning that you are willing to sacrifice a little bit of your comfort and your plan will be cheaper. So all that money should be used to pay for the capacity cost for the wind and solar and batteries, large scale batteries. But paying for energy, probably we don't have to do this anymore. So how to actually do that, I don't know. I probably have to talk to economists and how to form, form the market. But if you think about it that way, so you have this generation that generates electricity for free, doesn't cost anything, but it does cost a lot of money to put all this infrastructure in place. And at the demand side, you have this huge flexibility so that as an end customer, if you also, if you use an electric car basically as a backup or even a replacement, uh, an alternative to your home battery, um, and if you leave to your um, retailer or aggregator or whichever company will sell you the plan, if, you, if they also bear the risk uh, uh, of um, having to replace the battery every five years, if you don't have to care about that, then why would you worry? Um, after a while, when you realize that you are able to, to drive to work every day, you can still cook your dinner, you can do whatever you, you could do before, and your electricity bill is lower, who cares if somebody else controls my resources? So I guess maybe that's a bit, I don't know, the future we are heading to, how to make this happen, I don't know, but I think that it, it like at the technical uh, level, it, it makes a lot of sense. And, um, but yes, yeah, so I mean, to answer your question, I guess electric vehicles, yes, are a huge resource, um, which we should 
find ways to use it so that we can all benefit. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, okay, Simon, uh, which state seems to be showing the greatest potential in action to bring this to reality? <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, obviously, the problems are the much more pressing. Um, I mentioned uh, South Australia and Queensland. So they already have problems in distribution networks where they actually have to do something about it. Um, New South Wales, maybe a few isolated pockets. Um, but in terms of which state stands out as being the most active, I think the, um, all the work that's currently been done, funded by ARENA, um, also uh, sponsored by EMO, I think it's like nationwide. So I don't think that any state really stands out, but to be honest, I don't know. Um, uh, so another question from Gayan, uh, for the bi-level formulation you've proposed, how is this consensus reached? Uh, okay, so no, there is no, um, this is not a, so the, the optimal power flow is solved centrally by the DSO. And when the um, operating limit is sent to the customers, so the customer basically gets the power export limit for every five minute, 30 minute interval, and they operate, so they optimize their resources against that. There is no explicit coordination. We just rely on the fact that every customer will use the same optimization strategy. So then the DSO in the computation operating envelopes uses the same logic if you want. So that's why I think this coordination is sort of implicit, but not explicitly enforced in real time. Um, in practice, customers may do something else. So maybe they don't have smart batteries. They do just plain dumb self-consumption maximization, charge when PV is more than load, discharge when load is more than PV, which obviously, and we are trying currently uh, testing whether um, the DOE's uh, envelopes we computed are also effective in that case. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Gregor. I think we'll wrap up the webinar there. Um, round of applause for Gregor. Thank you for answering all these questions.